The very first airplane he ever stepped foot on, he owned it. I had a guy call me up out of the blue. He says, hey, I've got a 1944 street ride that I want to sell. I just finished building it. I don't want to keep it. I want to sell it. And I'll be honest with you, I want to sell it fast. I want to get it as far away from here as humanly possible. That was his exact words. And I said, well, sir, it just so happens I specialize in all of those things. I said, won't you come by, you know, come by my shop and hey, we'll talk it over, you know, discuss a few things and we'll make this thing go away. You know, a couple days later, nice Ford F-250 with a nice enclosed trailer pulls up and guy hops out, you know, mid fifties. See the ramp door and trailer open up and a few straps pop off. And by this time I'm walking my way to the trailer and backs out. Probably one of the prettiest 1944 two-door sedans you've ever seen. Just a good looking street rod, billet wheels, air ride suspension, small block, Chevrolet, you know, like all good Fords would have. And just a nice, tastefully done street rod. A very nice car, not a cheap car, a very high-end car. Um, street rods are a little cold. I didn't make that point to him. I said, you know, they're not selling like they used to. And I said, you know, I know you said you just finished it. And you can tell the car was very fresh. Um, matter of fact, the car had like 300 miles on it since they finished it. Beautiful leather interior in it, just a nice car. And so I made the point clear, like, you know, the money you put in this, you're probably not gonna get back. And especially paying someone to build this car for you. And he goes, I understand that totally. He says, it's not about the money, I'll be honest with you, I just, I just wanna get rid of it. He brought the car in, we checked it out a little further, looked on the bottom, absolutely gorgeous, really well built, nice car. Great driving car, said any issues or anything like that? He said, son, the 300 miles I drove is perfect. He said, I just wanna sell it. And I said, well, I'm assuming we have a title. And we discussed all this. I said, I'll tell you what, let me snap a few pictures. I make him find us a buyer and we don't even have to list it. I snapped a few pictures. He got back in his truck trailer. He went home, left the car with me. I called him back the next day. I said, hey, I think I found us a buyer. And we can send the car to Sweden. He goes, excellent. He gets it away. And I said, well, you need to come down here. We need to fill a little paperwork and we can put this deal together. Comes pulling up in a nice late model Z06 Corvette, bright yellow. And gets out and... White New Balance is on, just like every old Corvette driver has. He walks into my office, and you know, we get to talking. You got to think about it. There's a lot of paperwork we got to fill out. We're going through a lot of channels with this car. He brings his paperwork in, and I got my paperwork, and we start filling out things. And So I start kind of filling this guy out a little bit, you know, like, hey, what do you do for a living? He said, well, I got a few investments. I have some rental properties and things like that. And I said, Okay, that works. And, and I said, so why, why do you want to sell this car so bad? I said, it's none of my business, but I, I, I just got to know. Like, you can tell, like, there's something about this car you don't like. And he goes, it's not the car. It's who I built it for. I'm all ears, bud. What's going on? He goes, I built this car for my father. He died two weeks before the car was done. And he said, I'll be honest with you, it just reminds me of my dad. Every time I see it, I just kind of want to get it away. I said, man, I hate to hear that. I said, tell me about dad. I said, my dad sounds like a pretty good guy. He goes, my dad was a wonderful man. And you know, I said, really? And I said, well, I'm really close with my dad. And I mean, I can totally understand that. And, you know, we got talking a few little, you know, father-son stories back and forth. And I saw him, he had a big Clemson class ring on. I said, hey, Clemson. And he goes, yes, sir. And he said, me and my brother both went to Clemson. He said, my dad sent us both. We went through Clemson. And I said, so, so what did dad do for a living? He goes, he worked for the water company. And I'm like, let me get this straight. You just dropped off a $60,000 street rod, wholesale. You're driving an $80,000 Corvette. You've got a $100,000 little tow rig to pull your $60,000 street rod in. And he sent you and your brother to college and your claim to fame is, I have a few investments. And dad works at the water company. He said, dad made some right moves. I said, really? He goes, you gotta understand, my dad's only had one job his entire life, was working for the water company. So he started working there when he was 17 years old. And I'm talking about my, our local water company in Greenville, South Carolina, the Greenville Water System. Every time I pay my water bill, I think about this story and this guy. And he said, you know, my dad had been for the water company for years and he only had one job and he was road crew. I mean, literally bottom, you know, low man on the totem pole. He was that guy that came home covered in red clay every night. Me and my brother grew up in, with my mother and my father in a two bedroom, one bath house in Belton, South Carolina, which is a very small town, about 30 minutes outside of Greenville. We grew up in that little house. He said, my dad drove a used truck. My mother didn't have a car. That's the only vehicle we had, period, to go anywhere. We went to church, went to the doctor, went to the grocery store. This is what we drove was this old used Ford truck. 
my dad was proud of us, you know, and they said, me and my brother got good grades, so we got a little help with scholarships and things like that going to college. But my dad paid the majority of that for us to go, because it was so important for him that he didn't even finish high school, that we went to college. Our sophomore year of college, my dad did something so out of character for him that really kind of took us all by surprise. He said, my dad was very conservative, never been on a vacation, never been on an airplane, just work home, work home. He said, we went camping a few times. Other than that, that was the only type of vacation we ever went on. To my knowledge, he'd never been out of the state of South Carolina. So, you know, he was telling me all this and I mean, I'm just like, and I'm still like, where's all this coming from? You know, the guy at the water company, you know, so modest, everything's just, you know, whatever. And he goes, well, everybody knew that a new highway was coming through Greenville. And this is fast forward, you know, through the 60s. Now we're into the mid 70s. And they announced they were going to build a new highway coming out of Greenville, South Carolina, that was con going to connect us with the state capital of Columbia, South Carolina. The thing you got to think about before 385, this highway they're talking about was ever built or paved. The only way you got to Columbia is you had to go down two lane roads basically to get to it. Nobody knew exactly how it was going to fall. But, you know, there's speculation, all the old timers talking and all this big highway, they're ruining our small town, yada, yada. And he said, uh, dad asked me one Saturday morning, he said, you want to come riding with me? So they went riding. They went riding down this little road. And I'll tell you the name of the road. It's Edwards Road. They rode down Edwards Road. And I said, well, man, I know Edwards Road. I grew up off of Edwards Road. He goes, well, we drove down Edwards Road. And he said, just a little two lane road. We saw a long dirt driveway and pine trees everywhere. All of a sudden, Dad just turns off this dirt road. There's three little houses in the midst of all these pine trees. An older couple sitting on the front porch of the house all the way to the left. The old man gets up, walks out to the truck, and says, sir, is there something we can help you with? He goes, yeah. He goes, is this your property? He goes, yes, sir. It's family land. We've been here all our lives. My uncle lives right there, and my grandparents, actually, they just passed away, but they lived in this house. He goes, how much land you got here? So we got 250 acres. He goes, you ever thought about selling it? And he said, I've never heard my dad talk about wanting to buy land and buy property, you know? And, and I mean, the only thing we ever owned was the house we were in. And, and you know, and he said, he said, like, it blew my mind. Like, my dad's all of a sudden, he said, well, I don't think we, we really ever thought about selling it. He goes, but he said, will you take my name and number down? And he said, if you ever change your mind, would you give me a call? And this is before cell phones. I mean, this is the 70s. So he gave him his home phone number. Well, about six months goes by. They get a phone call. It's actually the wife. The man that they talked to passed away. She said, we don't need this land. This is way too much. It's time to, you know, downsize. We're going to get something manageable. Are you willing to buy? She said, but there's only one catch. We want to sell it all. So he asked her, well, how much will it take? And she told him he didn't have that kind of money, you know? So he said, one thing my dad was a big believer in was his 401k. He always put money back for that retirement. He always talked about those vacations he was going to take when he retired. He always talked about that stuff. Always talked about those big plane trips that are going to go on. First time on an airplane and, and things like that. He said, we used to go to the airport and watch airplanes take off and land. He said, and just think, I wonder where they're headed, you know, and this and that. And he said, just all this stuff that we were going to do when he retired because he put his money in that 401k. And his retirement's going to be so nice working for, you know, a, a government company, you know, and, and great benefits and all this stuff. All these years of hard work, this is where it's going to pay off. So he went out, he mortgaged his home, he emptied out his 401k, he borrowed $50,000 from his brother, who also mortgaged his home to get the money, and they bought these 250 acres. Now, why did he buy these 250 acres? Well, keep in mind, this man at this time had been there for years. Everybody knew him. He was a staple. He was almost like the mascot for the water company. And he saw the plans for 385. And everybody was really hush-hush about it. And, I, and he said, I don't know if they thought my dad probably didn't know any better when he looked at those plans. But the thing you got to understand, he said, if anybody in the world knows the roads in Greenville, it's my dad. He works them every day. He was that guy. He said, way before GPS, if you need to get somewhere in town, he could tell you every street, every pothole, every manhole cover between here and there. So naturally, he could glance at a set of plans and just like that, he knew exactly where you were at. He saw that big highway project and saw a big square box. He was kind of banking that, you know, at a quick glance, this piece of property he bought was where that square box is supposed to be. And inside it was MSD.
Don't know what MSD is. Might be a big plant. Don't know. All I know is we got a big highway shooting right down the side of it. And he's got 250 acres of pine trees and three rundown houses. So he lists it with a local realtor. And everybody told him it's crazy. His wife, and he said at the time, his wife almost left him because of this. He said, you've lost your mind. You've literally bankrupted us. In you know, the later years of our, or older years of our life, for some idea that's probably never going to happen. Well, they list it with a local realtor. And he explained to her the same thing. She said he was crazy. Six months goes by, they don't even get a phone call. 385 comes through and runs right down beside it. Just like, literally, like, like just played out just like the plan. Another six months goes by, not a phone call. His brother, who he borrowed the money from, gave him a call. He said, have you ever thought about listing it with a larger real estate firm? You know, you got to think about it. There was no internet back then. You know, there was no MLS list or anything like that. He said, you ever thought about maybe listing with a larger firm that deals with larger companies and has a wider spread than a local realtor? So they actually went to Atlanta and they listed that property with a firm here in Atlanta. So they came out and basically put their sign in the front, but they have their connections too. Well, he said, the next thing you know is something I'll never forget. And this is the guy telling me the story. This is the son. He said, I'll never forget. Said, Every Friday night, we went to the local clock restaurant, which is like a hamburger joint. And we got a hamburger plate every night. That was our Friday night ritual. And we sat down and watched TV together and ate cheeseburgers every Friday night. Me, my brother, my mom, and my dad. Phone rang. First words out of my dad's mouth. Who the hell's calling during supper time? It's Atlanta calling. Mr. Cochran. Would you be interested in selling 100 acres of your property? No, sir. No, sir. I want to sell it all. Mr. Cochran, I don't think you understand how much we can get you for just 100 acres of your property. He goes, I'm listening. And he said the phone dropped. He said, my dad, lucky he'd been struck by lightning. He was a multimillionaire almost overnight. Just selling 100 acres of this property. A wealthy man like this, his life has changed totally. You know, they got the deal closed and went through. He didn't tell anybody. Just, you know, just right there, the media circle knew. He paid his brother back first thing, because that's the right thing to do. He even gave his brother a little interest, just for helping. He worked for the water company for another six months, just in case. This man worked on the side of the road in his 50s, digging ditches, and was a multi-millionaire, just in case. Well, eventually, his, his kids... Talk to him and once you retire, just stop. You're fine. He said, my mother always complained about how small our house was. You know, the two bedroom, one bath house. Daddy, won't you build you a big, nice house? You own the property. You know, hell, move up to Greenville. He builds on to the house. He died in that house, still live there. But he did have a little fun. He took his sons out one at a time in that old Ford truck and went down the motor mile down Lawrence Road and said, son, you were great kids, and I love you boys with all of my heart. And you were the only two that didn't think I was crazy. I will buy you any car you want. So they went to the local Chevrolet dealership, which was on the far end of Lawrence Road at the time, and he bought the guy that I was selling the car for, a brand new Z28 Camaro, bright red. Well, the other brother couldn't be outdone. He bought him a brand new Pontiac Trans Am from Sitting Buick Pontiac, and he goes, all right, well, one of you boys happened to park your car for a little bit and drive my truck for me. They went to the Jaguar dealership, and he bought him a brand new XJ6 Jag, 1978. He drove that car to the day he died in 2006. Do you realize the money he spent to keep this Jag running this long? Wire wheels, loaded out. It was the car he wanted. Went out and bought his wife a brand new Lincoln Continental because that's what she wanted. They sold some more property. Some more people wanted to buy the rest of it. And he still had a few, he, he still kept about 50 acres. But, you know, started, you know, more and more. And they started grading and developing. The guy I'm selling the car for, he calls his brother up. And then he calls his brother, the guy's uncle. And he says, hey, let's go up to Charlotte. I got something I want to go look at. So they get in that Jag and they drive up to Charlotte. They go meet his brother, you know, the guy's uncle. And he lived up there. And he drove out to a little airstrip with all these big hangars outside of Charlotte. Guy walks out and says, hey, Mr. Cochran, how are you, sir? He said, doing great. He said, you here to see it? He said, yes, sir. They open the hangar doors. And he goes, what do you guys think? You know, and my brother and you know, my uncle both said, holy shit. 
He bought an XC90 King Air. It was a million dollar plane in 1979 when he bought it. The very first airplane he ever stepped foot on, he owned it. The very first airplane he ever flew in, he owned. He ended up getting his pilot's license and actually flew that plane. He took his entire family on vacation in it. The brother still owns the plane to this day. And obviously, you know, when he passed, he had had some other investments, you know, and he, he spread that through the family. And everyone, from that one little chance that guy took, totally changed his entire family's outlook on everything. And every everything they did, it changed everything. And I'm over here just, just lost. I mean, telling the story, I totally forgot my paperwork, everything. You know, the coolest part of the story is, MSD, what's the square box? Well, MSD stood for Major Shopping District. It ended up being the Haywood Mall. It's the only two-story mall in the state of South Carolina. It's still, to this day, the largest mall in the state of South Carolina. A very cool fact about the Haywood Mall is in 1980, when Ronald Reagan was elected president, it was one of the very first stops he made after being elected president was the Haywood Mall. And just think, all of that got started from one little peon at the water company. We'd like to thank Dream Car Exchange for supporting the VinWiki YouTube channel this month. DCX is an enthusiast marketplace with auctions for amazing cars happening now. We've got some awesome things planned with them over the next few weeks that I think you'll enjoy. So please stay tuned, but now browse on over to their site and see if your dream car is the next one across the block.